Our speaker is Professor Bruce Taylor, Professor of Neurological Research at the uh, Menzies Institute for Medical Research at Hobart University of Tasmania. So he's coming from far away and it's quite late, I think, in Tasmania already. Thank you for staying up late for uh, the meeting. Um, he's a neurologist, also the Royal Hobart Hospital um, and uh, Monty focal motor neuropathy is one of the foci of his work for many years. Professor Taylor, please. Um, thank you for in, inviting me to this talk. Um, um, I'm uh, presenting from Hobart where it's now um, 10.30 at night and on a Friday night. And um, I'm sure it's, the weather there is probably very much nicer than it is here because it's raining terribly. So I'm going to talk to you about multifocal motor neuropathy, which is a subject I've been studying for the last um, really 25 years. And a lot of my interest in this subject was generated by my time at the Mayo Clinic with uh, Professor Peter Dick when it was a new and very exciting topic that we uh, were seeing these people with this newly diagnosed neuropathy and we are trying to work out what it was, what it meant and, and how, to, how to treat it effectively. Uh, so... Um, so monofocal motor neuropathy is a rare, and I'll emphasise it's a rare condition, but unique neuropathic disorder characterised by multiple motor neur motor neuropathies and selective focal motor conduction block. Its etiology and pathogenesis are unknown, but are presumed to be autoimmune. It's really only first described in the 1980s, and it's a distinct entity that can be separated from CIDP as we've just heard, and mad SAM or multifocal acquired demyelinating sensory and motor neuropathy on pathological and sometimes on clinical grounds. MMN is uncommon, and we've just done a prevalence study in Australia, and we've estimated the prevalence to be 1.33 cases per 100,000 population. And the incidence clearly is significantly less than this, because multifocal motor neuropathy tends to be a chronic disorder, and people have this condition for many years. It generally presents with painless asymmetrical weakness, particularly affecting the upper limbs and at least initially within the territories of mixed um, nerves. Muscle wasting is a very common in presentation. And as we just heard, at least 50% of cases express serum antibodies to gangliocyte epitopes, particularly GM1 or IgM anti-GM uh, GM1 antibodies. Although, again, uh, nearly half of the people who have this condition do not have antibodies to this. Many patients at least will initially respond to immunomodulation with IVIG. Sensory autonomic findings clinically or electrophysiologically are inconsistent with the diagnosis as are upper motor neuron signs. Prognosis is usually actually quite good with the disease being slowly progressive with few deaths directly attributable to MMN being reported. The prognosis however, for a hand function is significantly poor with most patients developing significant weakness of intrinsic hand muscles or forearm muscles over time, often markedly asymmetrical and markedly impairing um, function. The clinical criteria for multifocal neuropathy has been described by the European Federation of Neurological Sciences as still what the societies are still what we consider the gold standard. You know, the clear core criteria, both, and the two of these criteria both must be present. Slowly progressive or stepwise progressive, focal asymmetrical in weakness and its motor involved in the motor nerve distribution of at least two nerves for more than one month. If symptoms and signs are present in the distribution of one nerve only, a possible diagnosis can be made. And most importantly, no objective sensory abnormalities except for minor vibration sense abnormalities in the lower limbs. Supportive criteria include predominant upper limb involvement, decreased or absent tendon reflexes in the affected limb, absence of cranial nerve involvement, cramps and fasciculations in the upper limb, and response in terms of disability or muscle strength, you know, modul modulatory treatment, particularly IVIG. Ex um, our exclusion criteria, upper motor neuron size, marked bulbar uh, involvement, sensory impairment more marked than minor vibration sense, low, sense loss in the lower limbs, and diffuse symmetrical weakness during the initial weeks. That's very atypical for motor, multifocal motor neuropathy. Um, so electrophysiologically, MMN, when established, has the following characteristic electrophysiological features, which is focal motor conduction block with normal sensory conduction to the same segment of the, of, if it is a mixed nerve, normal sensory nerve conduction studies, and chronic active partial denervation of muscles supplied by nerves with conduction block. 
And so, def, you know, we've all uh, I've heard about the definition of conduction block, and um, this is what is considered for definite conduction block, which is negative peak compound motor action potentials area reduction on proximal versus distal stimulation of at least 50%, whatever the nerve segment length, medium, ulnar and perineal nerves, and negative peak CMAV amplitude on stimulation of the distal part of the segment with motor conduction block must be greater than 20% of the lower limb and normal and greater than one millivolt. And increase of proximal to distal negative peak CMAV duration must be less than 30%. Probable is uh, the criteria are significantly less stringent, but still require really the presence of significant motor conduction block. You must have normal sensory nerve conduction in the upper limb segments with conduction block. That is, the sensory nerve conduction should be normal through areas of motor conduction block in mixed nerves. And evidence of uh, motor of a conduction block must be found in sites distinct from common entrapment or compression sites. And these are a couple of examples on nerve conduction studies of um, definite conduction block with the right radial nerve as compared to a normal study in the left side. And as you can see, I uh, hope you can see my pointer here. And when you stimulate it approximately, there is a, a significantly, markedly reduced, nearly 90% conduction block in this normal, a normal distal conduction and normal on the opposite side. And this is an example in the median nerve where you've got significantly uh, normal distal conduction, and then conduction block, which is uh, shown uh, through all segments of the nerve. And again, without significant temporal dispersion, which is a really critical point. This is showing that the conduction block, this is an inching technique of the left median nerve, demonstrating that the conduction block occurs over a, an extremely short segment. And inching techniques can be very useful in determining this. And this would be considered quite atypical for a uh, a nerve with um, um, CIDP. So we've been very interested in the pathology of conduction block for quite a number of years now because um, many for many years, multifocal neuropathy was considered to be, in a, a lot of literature, to be a variant of CIDP. And it was thought that the conduction block represented the uh, focal demyelination, which was resulted in, in, in the... Um, uh, presence of conduction block very much as one would see in, uh, for instance, a um, GBS or tonica neuropathy or even, even in CIDP. But the absence of conduction, uh, the temporal dispersion and the very rapid onset uh, uh, over a very short segment would, would be entirely out of keeping with conduction block for those um, conditions. So um, when we started looking, there had been really two case reports of biopsies at sites of nerve enlargement by Auer and Kaji. Um, and there'd been one report of biopsy results from sural nerve biopsies. Um, again, the sural nerve is generally not involved in um, multifocal motor neuropathy, and, and therefore the um, conduction, uh, the very, very minimal abnormality seen in these nerves was probably not indicative of the true underlying pathology. This is the report from Kaji, which showed really multifocal uh, loss of uh, motor, uh, large motor fibers in, in uh, this is a biopsy from the brachial plexus. So what we undertook at the Mayo Clinic when I was working there, we had actually we looked at undertaking uh, fascicular nerve blocks from uh, at the site of conduction block. And what we would do would be we'd um, find, we'd determine a uh, conduction block clinically and generally uh, most commonly in a forearm nerve segment, the median of the ulnar nerve. Um, we'd go in and we'd and test, we'd go in intraoperatively doing nerve conduction studies, looking at, uh, and we'd isolate a fascicle, which showed complete block, as this one does, and then we'd biopsy that fascicle. And what we found was really quite striking. Firstly, we found no demyelination. And this is the um, a, a person who had um, onset of right and left median nerve conduction block with a right nerve here showing multifocal fiber loss, significant uh, regenerative clusters, which we can see here in these small um, fibers, a markedly altered uh, nerve fiber density with a predominance of small fibers and lost large myelinated fibers. And on the left hand side, you can see again this fascicular biopsy with really quite normal appearing um, uh, um, axons, uh, a normal appearing nerves with uh, normally myelinated and a normal distribution of nerve fibers. And there was 80% conduction block at in this fascicle. So what we um, saw here was that we could show 
but in older and more established um, uh, nurse with multifocal neuropathy, you have dropout of large fibres, um, you've got regenerative clusters, and you had no evidence of demyelination and no evidence of inflammation. And in a nerve which is clearly blocked, you had no, um, you had a pathologically essentially normal nerve. And this just shows this in um, close up, and you can see again this relatively normal nerve on this side. This is a different case. And on this side, you can see this dropout of large myelinated fibers, but these quite prominent small fibers. And this is um, something we saw across now uh, around about 10 nerves looking at this as a site of conduction block. This is a much more established in case of multifocal neuropathy. This man had had um, the disease for 25 years. And again, you can see this multifocal fiber loss. Again, the dropout of um, large myelinated fibers and these clusters of regenerating nerves. And this is a, a high-powered um, obfuse nerve. And you can see these um, regenerative clusters, which are very typical of nerve regeneration. This is a, an, another nerve we can, which we looked at. I mean, this nerve, we can see again, this distribution pattern with this large and lots of small fibers, a few inflammatory cells, lots of small um, clusters here, some thin myelin, but clear, significant conduction block. And again, this is another nerve, which is um, a less um, well-established um, one year of duration of symptoms. And again, you can see relatively normal nerve, um, nerve fibers, relatively normal nerve distribution but perhaps slight thinning of nerve fibers. And again, more than 80% conduction block through this fascicle. So both clinically and pathologically, MMN is characterized by features of axonal loss with weakness, atrophy, and fasciculations occurring in the territories of mixed peripheral nerves without evidence of sensor or upper motor neuron involvement. So what about focal motor CIDP? This is a condition which we, we think is being recognized more and more. And so... This is a biopsy of someone who presented with a uh, conduction block across their um, um, brachial plexus. This is a fascicular biopsy of the brachial plexus. Again, you can see this multifocal fiber loss. You can see these regen regenerative clusters and, um, here, some onion bulbs, clearly um, demyelination on T's nerve fibers and onion bulbs and some inflammation. And this biopsy um, we just published uh, last year, which showed when we thought that this uh, clinically and electrophysiologically, you look like multifocal money dropping, but in fact, almost certainly had CIDP. So nerve excitability studies are another means by which you can do this differentiate between multifocal motor neuropathy. And there are a number of things on nerve excitability studies, which are very typical of multifocal motor neuropathy and point to dysfunction of the sodium potassium um, uh, gated channels at the node of Ronvier. And um, here we have some nice nodes of Ronvier. And when you look at the um, structure of the node of Ronvier, it, it's a very, very complicated structure with multiple um, uh, no, uh, ion channels there. And one of the hypotheses is that, um, in fact, um, uh, multifocal motor neuropathy is a paranodopathy where the, the nodes themselves are affected and you get functional conduction block at the node. And as we can see in the nerve biopsies, which showed no evidence of um, pathology early on in the disease, you can then um, imagine that you've got a functional block, which uh, blockage of conduction over time with continued block, you start getting secondary axonal degeneration and leading to the loss of nerve fibers, which is characteristic of late um, uh, onset, um, uh, a later um, duration, a longer duration multifocal motor neuropathy. And this is, in fact, a um, biopsy from one of our patients with uh, multifocal motor neuropathy, showing, in fact, widening of the nodes of Ronvier in this patient, as you can see here, 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 and here. We didn't know really what that meant when we took this biopsy in um, 25 years ago, but now we think it might indicate that the, this is an indicative of where the immune inflammatory attack is. And you notice it's a completely normal myelin elsewhere. So we've heard a little bit about high-resolution ultrasound, and there's been considerable interest in this topic. And high-resolution ultrasound um, is becoming, as, as Peter uh, Vandenberg uh, uh, noted, is becoming quite useful in uh, the diagnosis of CIDP. And it's very useful in distinguishing CIDP um, a, a from motor neuron disease, particularly in motor predominant things, because you lose a, muscle, a nerve um, area and um, in, the, in motor neuron disease, which is one of the principal diagno differential diagnoses of MMN. But in these conditions, MMN in MADSAM and CIDP, you will often see that there's an enlargement of the nerve. 
But whether it's useful in distinguishing between MMN, um, and MADSAM and CIDP is another question which has not clearly been um, ascertained as yet. And as you can see here, this is an, um, a nerve. This is from a, a paper. Um, and you can see that you can see this is a normal appearing nerve. And this is on Doppler. There's no real um, increased um, uh, uh, vasculature. But on, on the other side, you can see that there's a loss of the um, structure and enlarged nerve and increased um, nerve blood uh, flow, suggestive of an, of an inflammatory process. And again, the similar sort of thing. You can see that this is the ulnar nerve, which appears normal on the left. And then you can see a much a larger hypoechogeneity of the ulnar nerve on the other side, suggestive of an inflammatory neuropathy. And finally, here again, you can see a normal appearing nerve on the left. And in some with CIDP, the nerve is significantly enlarged. And again, whether um, it seems to be that you can tell this clearly between, um, well, not clearly, but um, relatively reliably between um, normals and uh, inflammatory neuropathy, but whether you can tell between different inflammatory neuropathies is now uh, is not uh, clearly stated as yet. MRI, as we've heard about in CIDP, has been suggested as a supportive criteria for the diagnosis of MMN is the a, is a detection of diffuse nerve swelling of the brachial plexus. Um, you can just de demonstrate abnormalities of the cervical roots and plexus um, in around 30 to 5 to 50% of people with um, MMN. But whether some of these people who are included in the study actually have focal motor CIDP is difficult. This is from, again, um, published in um, JNNP in 2011, and you can see this markedly enlarged nerve roots in the brachial plexus with block um, in, in these nerves at herbs point. Now, um, whether this person truly had um, CIDP or multifocal CIDP, or whether they had MMN is difficult to tell, but they clearly, you can actually see that there's a, you can actually use MRI, particularly at the brachial plexus to show nerve inflammation. Um, and so as, as noted, it's clearly not specific enough to be able to define MMN. So how do we treat um, MMN? And we heard, again, that IVIG is by far the most, most widely studied and successful treatment for MMN. The first reports of successful treatment for, from 1992. There have been five randomised controlled trials IVIG and MMN, all demonstrating a clear benefit. There was a meta-analysis um, constructed by the Cochrane Group and they found that 78% of people with MMN treated with IVIG compared to only 4% of those treated with placebo improved. There's also a suggestion that um, patients treated with IVIG had improved in disability, but this did not reach statistical significance. Um, disease, in terms of disease severity and outcomes, several studies have looked at markers of poor outcome and have found longer disease duration, decreased CMAP amplitudes, increased disability, and muscle atrophy and years untreated, and not surprisingly, um, are associated with a poor outcome. This is some of my own data from our Mayo Clinic longitudinal study showing that despite treatment, again, treatment at this stage was not um, as good as it is nowadays, but overall people lost um, CM CMAPs over time um, with, with this condition, and we were able to follow people for many months. And in almost all cases, um, there was a loss of CMAP amplitude. Um, one study has shown that using higher dosages of um, CIVOG may reduce axonal degeneration, also promote re innovation. And the overall consensus from all the IVIG studies is, is that early treatment and early diagnosis are important to minimize weakness and subsequent disability. But what we don't know is the treatment is based on really nothing. We don't have any um, treat, uh, dosage um, studies. We, the uh, maintenance dosages are based on what has been developed in the, um, the we used in the trials. There's no been, um, there's been no dose finding studies. There's no, I, no real knowledge about when to stop therapy and when to use a second line agent. And many people with, CI, um, CI, uh, with MMN end up on long-term IVIG and with in Australia now, we've got a requirement that everyone needs to have a trial of weaning to maintain their IVIG um, usage and to prove that they actually do require the disease, uh, the treatment, because 
we see over time that many people don't require long-term treatment. Um, you know, the, the um, well, um, there are, I'm sorry, there are no clear guidelines of monitoring or utilisation of a second-line agent. And SCIG has now become available for treating um, uh, MMN, and it has potential advantages over regular um, IVIG. Um, it's, uh, it could be a much more stable um, serum level. Um, it, it's more convenient to the patients. There may be a cost benefit and there may be a better overall adverse effect profile. Um, it's been shown that uh, it is a, an effective treatment for IVIG. One of the debates has been about whether you need the same dosage of SCIG as you have for IVIG. And several studies have looked at that. One study showed that you could use one for one. And another, uh, other studies have shown that you, you need to use um, higher dosages. And the one that was seen to be most effective was about 1.5 to 1, meaning that more SCIG is required to maintain patients with MMN than IVIG. That was what I was just talking about, about SCIG and 1.53 to 1 was the dosage which seemed to be the most effective. Second line therapy in MMN is really a vexed issue. There's no class one evidence for any other treatment um, in MMN. Um, Plex and steroids or plasma exchange steroids have been associated with worsening and are not recommended. Although, again, this is based on case reports and very small series. There are um, you, cyclophosphamide is the, uh, generally the second uh, the agent of choice. But again, the data is really on very limited numbers of people. And um, a cyclophosphamide. Um, is a, a drug which, has, as we all know, has a significant side effect profile. You're talking about a chronic disease. You've got dosage limits on taking cyclophosphamide. And um, although there was uh, some evidence in this study by Mucci et al. met from many years ago that they were able to reduce the use of IVIG, there have also been other studies which have not shown and not shown it to be as successful. It has a lot of side effects, cyclophosphamide. It's... Um, really not been the subject of any randomised controlled trials um, and therefore it should really be used judiciously and cautiously, um, sorry, only in people who have um, uh, really refractory CID, uh, MMN who are rapidly progressing, who have not responded to IVIG. There have also been trials of rituximab, eculizumab and um, interferon beta and a variety of other drugs which have not been conclusively effective and, and in some cases have really shown no benefit, particularly interferon beta. So at the moment we have one treatment which is shown to be ineffective. Second line treatment is really very difficult. And as Peter Vandenberg says, we, if you're running out of options with IVIG, referral to a specialist centre would be um, for consideration to review the diagnosis to make sure that they don't have um, a, a, variant, an, a, a mimic and um, um, uh, then to consider a second line agent. So I'd, I'd just like to end there and uh, thank um, people for, uh, thank you to uh, the organisers for inviting me to speak. And um, this is Tasmania where I live. And if anyone wants to come and visit, please do so. And happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Taylor. Great lecture. Uh, before you go to sleep, maybe we still have a couple of questions that we can ask you. Uh, Certainly. Quite a few have come in. Yeah. So, I can uh, see there's a so, number of them on the chat. Yeah. So if we start maybe from Professor Vandenberg, uh, increased detection of rates of anti-GM1, uh, IGM, uh, in, com uh, in combination with the glycolipid yes. galactocerebrosidase has been reported. Yes, absolutely. And... But it's still it, you know, completely correct, um, but the, uh, it's still not 100%. You know, we're talking, you know, it improves the specificity 60 65%, but you've still got a significant proportion of people who are not um, positive for any of the testing that um, we can do. They're not positive for IgG4. They're not positive for um, test space. Uh, so then these people, there are a significant group of people with typical MMN who still have no ganglioside antibodies. Don't, they maybe we, have, we just haven't found them yet. I don't know what Peter thinks. <laughs> uh, 
another question on nerve ultrasound. Does nerve focal enlargement remain lifelong also after axonal degeneration? Um, that's a good question. And again, there have not really been an, enough longitudinal studies in this condition. And with, when, you, when people lose nerve fibers, as you can see on the biopsies, they start losing, um, you know, their nerves do become smaller. And so there is a reduction in, um, and in late stage, you may find when you do a nerve ultrasound that the nerve actually looks small. It's certainly not enlarged. So um, it really depends on the timing of the thing. And again, the question becomes to me is whether some of these people, when you do nerve ultrasound um, and you show very large nerves, are they actually a form of focal CIDP, which you can only answer by a biopsy? Then uh, three, uh, treatment therapy in patients with MMN who failed IVIGs, do you still try corticosteroids or PLEX? Uh, no, we, the, <laughs> that's a good question because um, the, 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 the reports of people worsening with PLEX and worsening with steroids are really quite old now. Um, and as we know, they, they are a very effective treatments for immune therapy and you know, in reality, it, it's very difficult to give them a trial because of the, the negative press they've reserved, received. Um, and so I've done, I don't use that. I tend to use, what I tend to do is really, really look hard at the diagnosis, make sure I'm not missing the, uh, an, an, another diagnosis, particularly monomelic amyotrophy or, um, and, and, and or motor CIDP, have a low threshold to doing fascicular nerve biopsies have a low threshold to doing um, ultrasound and MRI. And if I'm still seeing um, that there is evidence for inflammation on those studies, I will use things such as rituximab, which I'm much more uh, familiar with rather than using steroids. I also have used in the past cyclophosphamide, but I've, again, I would, you know, this is something I've been doing for 25 years. You, cyclophosphamide, is a drug uh, where you and you know, where you run into trouble with it over the years, and you you always end up with you know reaching your maximal dosage. You're not it's not a easy drug to use in this thing. So I will tend to use rituximab. I don't know what Peter does. <laughs> okay, uh, and the last question: uh, Could the presence of activity dependent conduction block, but not conduction blocks, at rest without the activity be considered for diagnosis of MMN? Yes. Um, that's, a, again, another excellent question. Um, when you look at the nerve um, excitability studies, those exercise-induced and conduction blocks are, are suggestive of um, uh, MMN. And, yes, you can, you know, it really requires quite specialised equipment, quite specialised expertise. But if you can demonstrate that, it's highly suggestive of um, MMN. And same with cold-induced. Okay. We'll hear about axonal excitability studies later on uh, during the day. Uh, but I would like to thank you very much for your contribution to the symposium. Please uh, stay with us if you're not too um, sleepy. Uh, uh, and thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you, All right. thank you very much.